So any collection, any collection of fluid, which could be you know, blood, it could be pus, it could be referred to as you know, perfusion or an empyema. So basically, radiographically speaking, uh, pre-refusions will look you know, homogeneous, you know, in density, uh, it's going to lose. We are going to lose the costophrenic angles and obviously there's going to be loss of the hemidiaphragms and basically you will have a meniscus that is, you know, you're going to see, which is a quite classic, you know, to see that you know, the, the, what you're dealing with here is, uh, a, you know, um, a, a pre-refusion. And usually there is no air bronchograms, you know, when you are looking at pre-refusions. Uh, for those that missed in the, the, the first part, I explained what a bronco, you know, air bronchogram looks like. Um, so this is the classic example of a, a, a pleurifusion. We, we do have you no know, obscuration of the left costophrenic angle here. There is a complete white out of the you know, uh, lower lung zone on the left side here. Notice that you know, we do have the homogeneous you know, uh, increased density to the uh, left side here. And then we do have a meniscus here, which is quite classic in, um, in, uh, in a pre-refusion. So that is a classic example of a pre-refusion there. Uh, over here, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, very subtle pre-refusions can be actually mi be missed. Uh, if you're rushing, if you're a clinician, and you're rushing because you're busy or you've got, you've, you've been inundated with a lot of patients, you know, you just cast your eyes and you may miss a very subtle pre-refusion. Notice that, you know, the, the, the right costophrenic angle here is sharply acute. It is nicely demonstrated, but on the left side here, we do have uh, the loss of definition of the left costophrenic angle, which in this case here, this is, a pleural effusion. You know, sometimes it may be very difficult for you to see, uh, to, to, to differentiate between a pleural effusion and, and uh, an empyema. So usually uh, if pleural effusion is actually infected, it becomes more or less like thick and quite infected. It, people tend to use the word, you know, empyema in this case. So if this has been long standing, or let's say more than, let's say a month old or something like that, you know, people would be saying this could be either pleural effusion or an empyema. That's, a, that's another example of, you know, pleural effusion. We see that, you know, on the left lung, this is quite a large, you know, left-sided pleural effusion with possibly a moderate pleural effusion on the, on the right side. Usually, clinicians, when they are when they see these bilateral pre-refusions, this is actually you know uh, cardiac related. So this patient possibly might have you know cardiac you know uh, 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 heart failure. So heart failure usually you know uh, it it presents with patients with bilateral pre-refusions, like in this case. Notice here that you know, there is actually a complete white out on the uh, left lung here. And uh, the other classic example, you know, uh, a classic feature to notice when you are looking at pleurifusions is that you know, a, a pleurifusion usually pushes the mediastinum and the trachea away from it. So all the mediastinal structures you know, over here, they have been pushed away from the site of the the, the, the abnormality. So look at the trachea, it has been deviated towards the left side here, and then the heart has been pushed away from the site of the uh, pleural effusion. Notice also that, you know, in pleural effusions, the, the intercostal spaces get a little bit wider, you know, the, 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 the ribs tend to spread out a bit because of, uh, of that. Uh, if you had a, a lung collapse, lung collapse will pull, you know, the intercostal uh, spaces together. And then you may see that the, the separation between the ribs becomes a little bit narrower, you know, uh, uh, unlike in pre in this case. Pulmonary edema, 
Again, this is actually fluid accumulation in the lungs, uh, and then it causes the flooding of the alveoli with fluid. So uh, normally the alveoli have to be filled with, if, with air, uh, but when there is actually pulmonary edema, uh, there is insufficiency of the heart to pump out you know, uh, fluid. And then these fluids get to you know, collect in the uh, uh, alveoli. And then pulmonary edema, again, when you see it on a chest x-ray, you know, it will uh, show increased you know, uh, air space opacifications which uh, you know, I will show you. So air opacifications are, 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 are normally uh, a normal feature in pulmonary edema. What are the causes of pulmonary edema? You know, there could be cardiogenic causes, maybe because this, the patient has got a heart failure, or it could be due to non-cardiogenic you know, features like renal failure or iatrogenic you know, fluid overloads and things like that. So um, clinicians would want to see exactly what could be causing, you know, pulmonary edema, and then this, you know, a request uh, requests normally are quite uh, common, you know, um, you know, to query pulmonary edema. I will show you how it looks like on a chest X-ray anyway. So the first feature that you see is actually these are septal lines. Septal lines are just. Uh, um, reticular shadowing that you see in the subbrural spaces. Um, 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 uh, let, let me say this. When you're looking at a chest X-ray, there are uh, conditions that will say they are either uh, paren parenchymal or uh, infections, or we can say uh, um, um, the, the, the uh, interstitial uh, uh, diseases as well. So interstitial diseases and uh, um, the uh, lung parenchymal diseases are totally different. So septal lines in this case here, these are lines that you see in the subbrural space because of the accumulation of fluid in, the, in them. Um, so these were described by a, um, a, an Irish chap who, who was um, a radiologist who sort of named these kind of lines, you know, when he was doing his work. So they become thickened actually uh, when there is fluid in there, or there is a tumor, or there is actually fibrosis. So you, you tend to see what they call interstitial or uh, shadowing, or people would say um, uh, reticular shadowing, which is quite linear to the periphery of both lungs. So some of the causes obviously will be you know, uh, interstitial pulmonary edema, or somebody could have, um, you know, lymphangitis carcinomatosa. So uh, normally patients who might have, you know, cancer uh, of the lungs, or they may have um, a distant, you know, pathology, let's say colonic cancer or any other type of cancers, you know, uh, you know, uh, they may have, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, breast cancer or any type of cancer you know, through the, the lymphatic system, you know, you, you tend to get, you know, uh, um, lymphagitis carcinomatosa, which presents like, you know, septal lines to the periphery of both lungs. So in this case here, you can see on the, on the right here that there are some lines which are running diagonally perpendicular to the periphery of the lung here. So these are what they call the septal lines. They run perpendicular to the, uh, to the orientation of the lung. As you can see possibly over here, you know, these are the septal lines. Let's see, maybe the next diagram will show me the, uh, so look at these. So these are the septal lines. These are what they call the linear articulations to the periphery of both lungs, quite common in patients with pulmonary edema. So uh, when you see these ones on the chest X-ray, you know, uh, it should raise questions about the pulmonary uh, edema itself, or uh, there could be a heart condition that this patient may have, or somebody might have got, you know, might have had cancer, or they do have cancer, you know, possibly presenting, you know, you know elsewhere. COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 obviously present, it's, it's a new, it's not a new thing, actually. COVID has been there for quite some time anyway. Uh, but the COVID-19 obviously is a new phenomenon 
you know, it happened in Wuhan. It was actually sort of, uh, you know, uh, somebody who, uh, who proposed, who sort of saw it, you know, obviously, you know, they, were, they had the, the, the test kits, but, you know, after the test kits had, uh, had run out because of so many patients, they resorted to be doing chest X-rays and the uh, CT scans. So predominantly the uh, uh, COVID, you know, tend to present, you know, it's more like, you know, a pneumonic kind of, you know, appearance. It tends to affect the periphery of both lungs, particularly predominantly both lungs from the from from mid mid to lower lung zones. So you can see that there are consolidations around here, you know, to the right lung, and possibly you can see a bit of consolidations around here on the left lung here with peripheral predominance, actually. But we can also in see in the literal cardiac density, you know, to the left lower lobe here there is that you know, opacity obviously there. So COVID tends to affect the periphery of both lungs and very, very rarely do we see you know, pleural effusions in COVID. So these doctors actually, when they did the chest X-rays, they, they could see you know, pneumonitis actually you know, presenting in that kind of format. Uh, over here, we are talking about the, the hyla and the higher abnormalities. I think we spoke about this one here last time. Uh, so just to, to recap the, you know, to just to go through, o, o, through over this, you're looking at the position of the higher, you're looking at the size and the densities of the, of the higher itself. Over here, uh, we spoke about this last time, but we can see that you know, these higher, they are actually, you know, uh, enlarged bilaterally. So in, in a patient who is less than, you know, 60 years, maybe 45, 50, you know, patients tend to present with sarcoid. So look at that. There is actually enlargement of both hyla in this case. On this patient here who presented um, in 2019 on the right here, everything seems to be quite normal here. They presented this year. And then you can see that, you know, the right hilum here is very thick. It is white and it has been pulled down, you know, towards the, the lower bit here. Notice that, you know, the right hemidiaphragm has been tented, meaning that it has been pulled as well. So there is tenting of the right hemidiaphragm here, pulling down of the right, you know, uh, hilum, very thick and quite dense. So in this case here, when you see that in your in a facility, this patient obviously, you know, if you've got CT, scan this patient would actually, you know, uh, uh, need a CT scan. Uh, basically my, my current study I'm doing is basically looking at, you know, uh, uh, is, 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 is regarding to chest, you know, imaging as it were. So this is possibly one of the things that you know, I'll be looking at as well, you know, uh, you know, this kind of case really. Notice here that uh, uh, there is actually a, a triangular density you know, involving the right, uh, you know, lower uh, uh, lung zone here. Uh, we have lost the right hemidiaphragm in this case. Uh, so because of this density around the, 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 the right uh, lung. So this triangular density here, like we spoke last time, it is uh, uh, showing that you know, we do have a right, right, right lower lobe collapse. Notice also that you know, we have lost the contours of the right you know, um, uh, high lamp here because it has been pulled because of the, uh, uh, the collapsed uh, right lower zone, right lower lung. Over here again, notice that you know, the rule of thumb is that uh, the right high lamp should not actually be above the left high lamp. Uh, at the best, they should be at the same level. The right high lamp should be down here. But in this case here, we have seen that you know, the right high lamp has been pulled up and it is actually uh, slightly above the left high lamp. This is abnormal because there is actually a panicost tumor over here, which has pulled the right high lamp towards it. So, um, uh, masses, uh, lung collapse, 
cancers and things like that. They, they, they tend to pull things towards themselves. So the anatomical uh, abnormality of the hilum here is that you know, it has pulled the right you know, hilum towards it. And then look at the opacification here you know, uh, in the right uh, epical area, den denoting that you know, we do have uh, you know, an abnormality in that region. Look at this one again. We do have very you know, enlarged hilum bilaterally here. So all these are thick, you know, uh, uh, hyla points, meaning that we do have lymphadenopathy, you know, going on. In a, in a patient who possibly might be coughing or they might have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, contact with somebody with a TB, you know, this could be early signs, you know, to see or rule out, uh, you know, uh, tuberculosis. Usually in TB, you tend to have possibly one, you know, hilum, you know, enlarged. But in this case here, I would query TB and the sarcoidosis as well. C is for circulation. Under circulation, you're looking for the cardiac size, you're looking for the left atrial enlargement, and uh, you are looking for the wide end mediastinum as well. So uh, remember, we spoke about the A, B, C, D, E approach. So in this case, the C is for circulation. Under circulation, you are trying to assess the uh, heart size, the left atrial enlargement. You are also looking for the wide end mediastinum. I must mention here that you know if you are a clinician, uh, and you are you 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 must be cautious to look at an AP chest X-ray or a supine chest X-ray, because these two will definitely you know influence the. Uh, the, the, the size of the cardiac shadow. On a PA projection, um, on a PA projection, the uh, cardiothoracic ratio has to be 0.5. Uh, on an AP, it has to be 0.6. So even if it is actually, you know, uh, done AP, 0.6, you know, is acceptable. For the for the heart to 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 be you know to, to measure that way, is there anything wrong with this image? So this image definitely is okay because we do have a right marker you know in place there. So and then we do have uh, the, uh, the 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 aortic knuckle on the on the right and the the ventricle you know the, the heart has been transposed to the to, to the right side. Notice also that we do have the you know, gas bubble on the left side, on the right side. So this is what they call the you know, situs inversus because there's been transposition of uh, you know, uh, body you know, organs and this as it were. So this is the cardiothoracic ratio. You know, the size of the heart on a PA projection has to be half, A has to be half of B, and then that should be 0.5 or 50%. Uh, cardiomegaly, you know, uh, obviously just a heart enlargement, which measures more than 0.5 on a PA projection or more than 0.6 on an AP projection. So uh, when you do a chest X-ray and then you see a left ventricle enlargement, you know, normally this would uh, be associated with the congestive heart failure or uh, um, uh, congestive, you know, yes you know, congestive heart failure. Um, normally, patients who are well-to-do, you know, middle-class people, you know, people that sort of tend to eat, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, meat or they, they can afford in a good meal, actually. Uh, they tend to actually have a bit of pericardial fat here and another pericardial fat over here. So these should not be misconstrued to be, you know, heart enlargement or anything at all. So this is basically, you know, uh, pericardial, pericardial fat. You know, when you see that, then obviously, you know, you could conclude that obviously, you know, uh, my sister here or my brother here, obviously, you know, can afford, you know, you know, uh, you know, some something to, you know, to eat. So this is is quite common in patients who are middle class or you know upper class kind of people, you know. This is an example of uh, cardiac enlargement. So we see that there is actually a bump here. 
So this bump here is actually the uh, uh, left atrial appendage or the left atrium, you know, so it has been, you know, enlarged. So remember last time I spoke about when, when you've got an enlargement of the, uh, of the, of the left atrium, it, it will cause the widening of the carino angle. So the carino angle is there, you know, so it's actually there. So normally books will say that, you know, the carino angle should not be more than 90 degrees. You know, depending on which book you read, some people say, you know, 100. So if the carino angle is actually increased, you know, one of the causes for that will be left atrial, you know, enlargement, like in this case. So this is the, you know, left atrial enlargement. Again, last time, I think, you know, uh, it was my brother, uh, I think you asked me something about this x-ray where we have a double heart size on the right side here. Again, a double heart size, you know, uh, would also mean that you know, the, the, the left atrium has been, you know, uh, enlarged and there's a bit of a rotation of the heart. So when you see the double heart side here, the double heart sign here on the right side, you know, denotes uh, left atrial enlargement as well. Widened metastinum, again, yeah, we have got to look at this. One of the causes of uh, wide, a widened metastinum is, I didn't put it over here, it would be somebody who was involved in an accident, you know, been involved in an accident and the steering wheel, you know, your chest hits against the st steering wheel or trauma could cause widened metastinum as well because the, you could have uh, a ruptured aorta or blood vessels, you know, in the metastinum would be ruptured so it would be bleeding, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the metastinum as it were. Other causes to be aortic dilatation. Aortic aneurysms can cause that too. Uh, dissection of the aorta could cause a widened metastinum. You know, lymph nodes can cause that. And then dilatation of the esophagus again can cause that too. Now, I must emphasize here that, you know, when we do chest x-rays, we must make sure that you no, know, our chest x-rays are not rotated because any rotation of the chest, you know, as you are, of the patient would actually mimic any of these, you know, uh, things that I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm not saying that we, we can be 100% correct in positioning our patients. Uh, otherwise, we must make sure that at least we do, we make every effort, you know, that the patient is not rotated as we do the chest x-rays. Again, you know, thyroid enlargement can cause, you know, a widened metastinum and the thermic tumors also can cause that. This is a patient, obviously, we can see that the, 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 the cardiac silhouette is enlarged. You know, we can see that the ascending uh, aorta is, uh, thoracic aorta is enlarged too, and so is the descending thoracic aorta. When you see this kind of picture here, you know, this patient is a very good candidate in your center to have a CT scan. So CT scan was organized for this patient here. And then we can see that this patient has got, uh, you know, uh, aortic dissection. So the uh, aortic dissection, you know, is just a tear within the walls of the, of the aorta here. So the ascending and descending aortas, they, they, ha, they, they, they are, they are dissect, dissected in this case. So a picture like that should warrant, you know, CT scan, or if you don't have one, you know, in your center, cardiology review should be considered actually as a clinical emergency in this case. Look at this picture again. We do have a widened metastinum here. So uh, widened metastinum, you know, uh, are quite say, common, you know, to see these ones in, 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 young, in young people, you know, pediatrics, you know, young people, we tend to see these kind of things. Or this could be just that, you know, it could be the enlarged litrosternal goiter, which could be causing this kind of, you know, appearance. Notice, on this image here, that you know, the trachea is not compressed at all, so it is aerated. There is absolutely no uh, what we call shibathith appearance of the of the trachea. So the trachea is well aerated. There is absolutely no uh, tracheal deviation to either the right or the left side here. Everything is just superb. 
On this one here, we can see that there is actually a homogeneous lobulated kind of mass, you know, in the center of the uh, superior metastinum, and that it is actually pushing the trachea to the right side here. There is actually narrowing of the, uh, of the, of the trachea in this case. I am not too sure on this plain x-ray whether we can rule out what we call tracheomalacia, but so a patient would need possibly a CT scan if you are worried about tracheomalacia, but there is good aileation or ventilation of both lungs in this case. So, you know, I think this could just be a retrostenogoiter here, which is causing this kind of, you know, appearance, you know, with the tracheal deviation to the left side. Um, as best as related lung uh, conditions, I think Zambia and many other countries in the world, they have banned the use of asbestos, but our parents, you know, or patients who could be above the age of 80, 75, you know, possibly people that grew up in the, you know, mining towns of Zambia or, you know, construction workers or wherever, you know, people be, uh, asbestos has been banned in most of the countries. But those of our parents, our grandparents who worked in those kind of you know, establishments, they might have been inhaling you know, uh, asbestos. And uh, you know, it, uh, my, uh, so those kind of fibers tend to find their way right into the lungs. And then they cause these kind of pleural plaques, which you can see around here. You know, they tend to be you know, quite thick, uh, uh, you know, quite thick kind of pleural plaques. They'll be here. There'll be some in the uh, uh, diaphragmatic areas bilaterally and things like that. These do not cause any problems at all. But you know, one of the uh, uh, downsides to this is that you know, somebody might have you know, what they call mesotheliomas, which are pleural based uh, you know, uh, uh, lung cancers. So when somebody presents to the hospital with possibly exposure to uh, uh, asbestos, what you'll be looking for will be things like, you know, these pleural calcifications and possibly, you know, uh, mesotheliomas, which I'll show you. So look at this. These are pleural plaques. They are everywhere. You know, they are well circumscribed with the very thick, you know, edges, you know, which you can see bilaterally in, you know, uh, you know in, in, in these kind of, you know, uh, both lungs and the uh, hemida, below the hemidiaphragms, as it were. So the books, depending on which book you read, you read, they say that you know, they look like in you know, a holy leaf appearance kind of you know description they say. So when you when you see holy leaf appearance kind of thing, they are talking about asbestos exposure. So this is how mesotheroma looks like. So they are plural based kind of you know uh, uh, lung lung cancers, and then these have got no good outcomes for the patients. Really, you know, it's quite. Uh, you wouldn't want to wish it for your, you know, on your enemy at all, you know. So this is quite bad. This is how you know it looks like, you know. There is, uh, you know, uh, lobulation kind of, you know, thick, you know, uh, pleural based, you know, mass here. When you do a CT scan, a CT scan definitely is going to confirm that you know, this could be appearances of a mesotheroma and things like that. So you know, once somebody has got this, you know, very bad, you know, outcomes or the prognosis is quite bad you know, for these ones. So basically, uh, this is why most countries have actually banned the use of asbestos, you know, because of this, you know, kind of thing. I think we spoke about plural based abnormalities. I'm not going to talk about these ones, but uh, uh, we spoke about these. Then the D is for disability. The disabilities, you'll be looking for things like, you know, fractures, you know, of the ribs, clavicles, you know, name them. You'll be looking for things like cancers. Uh, you'll be looking for things like, let's say, um, um, uh, vertebral collapses and, you know, all those kind of things. And then some people say that, you know, uh, for you to trick the eyes, you might want to rotate the, the, the extra 90 degrees so that, you know, your, your, your eyes can only be registering, you know, uh, bony structures instead of the lung details and things like that. So over here, somebody can spot a problem. It is not in the lungs, it's not on the ribs, but there is actually a problem around here. So there is actually a community fracture to the, uh, through the surgical neck of humerus with extension into the uh, greater tuberosity with possible, um, 
uh, uh, joint effusion in the right shoulder there. So always look at the bony anatomy. You could see a destructive bone lesion over there. You can see a fracture. You can see a dislocation. You can see things like you know autoimmune diseases, like for example hyperparathyroidism. You can see uh, rheumatoid arthritis possibly in those kind of areas as well. So it is important not only to focus your eyes on the lungs, uh, but also the bony structures as well. The E is for everything else. Everything else includes, you know, uh, you know, air under the diaphragm. You know, you can see subcutaneous emphysema or surgical emphysema, breast shadows, foreign bodies, and medical interventions, as it were. I must mention here, though, that you know, certain centers, you know, do not, at least uh, in my trust, we don't do uh, the three series we used to do uh, back home in Zambia, where we used to do uh, for uh, uh, intestinal obstruction or things like query pneumometastinum or perforated you know, viscous. We used to do uh, the uh, erect abdo, supine abdo, chest X-ray erect. Those, we don't do abdominal X-rays anymore. Uh, I would be surprised if at all people still do these ones because everything you need would be seen on an erect chest radiograph. In fact, this patient, before you do this patient, if they came on a bed, lying flat on a bed, they must be, they should wait for at least 15 minutes before a chest X-ray is done. It is a rule. The, the rule is that if there is any perforation, uh, perforation of the viscous, uh, if there is any pneumomediastinum, uh, pneumoperitoneum, sorry, the patient should be given time for the gas to start rising below, uh, to be trapped below the, 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 the hemidiaphragms, you know, as, as it were. So this is what it is. Look at that. We, we do have air beneath the, the, the diaphragm. So this is the hemidiaphragm on the right, hemidiaphragm on the left side here. Notice that we don't have the lung markings here. And we have also lost the, uh, the, the large bowels, as it were. Look at the fact that you know, the, on the right side here, the spleen has been pushed downwards and medially because of the presence of this you know, air around there. Look at also on the, on the right side here, there is abnormal presence of air beneath the right emitter from pushing the liver also down. One of the things that you can be confused on the right side here is what they call the uh, Kilaiditi syndrome. Kilaiditi syndrome is the interposition of the large bowels between the hemidiaphragm and the liver. So if the, if the liver and if, uh, the, the bowels and particularly the uh, hepatic flexure, the hepatic flexure sort of unfolds and then it, 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 it interposes itself between the, the, the hemidiaphragm and the liver, you tend to, call, to see what they call the Kilaiditi syndrome, which should not be confused with the uh, perforated viscous. This is a, a, an emergical uh, emergency when you see it. Remember, you should give the patient time, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, sitting up before the x-ray is done. If you do it, you may not see that. Talking about this, if you are a casualty officer, you're working in your casualty, you can do a supine chest x-ray and you can also see, um, 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 no, 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 you, 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 need, you need an erect chest x-ray to see this pneumoperitoneum, uh, uh, you know, yeah, you don't need a supine one. I was mixing it up with the, uh, an, a, 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 pneumo, a pneumothorax. Notice again, there is actually a normal presence of, uh, you know, um, uh, air beneath the right hemidiaphragm here, denoting that this patient has got a pneumoperitoneum. So the causes for um, a pneumoperitoneum would be, you know, largely it would be due to a perforated peptic ulcer. It could be perforated appendix or bowel or diverticulum. It could be post-surgical or traumatic causes. So everything 
you know, here I've mentioned that I've so, spoken about can cause those ones. If the request card lacks any of these kind of, you know, things on the, in the clinical history, largely, you know, over here, we tend to reject those x-rays. You know, it will be rejected and then obviously, you know, returned back to the referrer. So, um, so if you are uh, analyzing or if you're doing some kind of research on the justification of the X-ray cards in your center, you could do a study to see the justification of abdominal or chest radiographs with regards to, you know, let's say pneumoperitoneum or things like that, you know, a, a study for just for yourself, really. You know, just to, uh, to so that you you can you, you can in, increase your uh, ability to understand these things really. So uh, again, subcutaneous emphysema again or surgical emphysema is just presence of air in the subcutaneous layers of the skin. Again, those would be some of the causes for that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Examples here would include look at the. Uh, supraclavicular region of the neck here. We can see abnormal presence of air in, in, the, in, that, in, in the neck here, denoting subcutaneous emphysema. You know, things like a failed trauma could be one of the causes. A pneumothorax could be you know, one of the causes. Improperly you know, functioning chest drains could cause that. Osophageal rupture can cause that. Osophageal ruptures can be caused due to violent vomiting. You know, somebody could just be vomiting violently and things like that, and then they, they do have a, a chest, you know, chest, a chest pain. When you do a chest X-ray, you would see that you know possibly there is actually abnormal presence of air in the pneumomedastinum or in the pneumomedastinum, yes, and then you would see subcutaneous emphysema. So on a chest X-ray, you would I would be worried about the ruptured, you know, uh, esophagus in this case. So th this, uh, this could be caused by so many factors like I've mentioned. Look at this, there is actually diffuse, you know, um, uh, subcutaneous emphysema here in this patient. Uh, look at the presence of abnormal air in the subcutaneous tissues bilaterally, you know? So if it is an ICU patient, you know, patients have had drains in protein, you know, they can have, uh, these kind of appearances. Look at this diffuse, you know, bilateral uh, um, subcutaneous emphysema in the, you know, axilla, you know, and in the neck of the of this uh, of this patient. Notice also that we do have the uh, the. I think this is not it's not the latissimus dorsi. I think this will be the uh, the contours of the uh, pectoralis major. I think, you know, pectoralis major muscles. You know, sort of there is air getting right into the fascia of the, you know, the, the, the muscle, as it were. So these are the streaks that you are seeing here. But look at the diffuse, you know, uh, subcutaneous symphysema here. Notice also that we do have a drain on the right side here. Maybe one of the causes is that, you know, the, the, the side holes to this, you know, uh, a drain could not be right into the lung. So it is actually sort of, uh, you know, outside the chest cavity. And then this is actually causing, you know, the, you know, the emphysema as it were. Breast shadows are important again to see, you know, uh, you know no more patient with no mastectomies, but sometimes you tend to lose the breast shadows because of mastectomies. Notice here that, uh, I don't know how to remove this line. I don't know who I'd put it there. I don't know. Uh, but uh, notice also that, you know, this patient, we do have the breast shadow here on the on the right side here, and then on the on the right side here we do have the breast shadow over there too, and then usually in our lovely ladies, you know the lower parts of the lungs might a little bit might be you know whiter sometimes because of the uh, the breast tissues there, and then the upper bit of the same lungs might be a bit darker than the lower bits because of the presence of the the, the uh, breast shadows. Now, notice this, that on this patient, we do have the breast shadow on the, on the right side here, but we are losing the breast shadow on the, on, the, on the right side. So this patient has had a mastectomy done. Notice also here that we do have some surgical clips here. 
meaning that the patient has had surgery, you know, in the past. So we, when you see a presence of these, you know, uh, um, uh, surgical clips, no breast shadow here, this should prompt you further to start looking for destructive bone lesions. You, you, might, you might see a destructive bone lesion, you know, uh, maybe the, the humeral head is, you know, being eaten away, or you may see that you know, there could be some metastatic deposits in any of these bony structures around here, or you might see a pathological fracture, you know, through the, through the heart there. So not, it's very, very important that when you see these kind of things or a missed breast shadow, start interrogating further because you might miss something that is quite uh, significant. Foreign bodies and medical interventions, again, are quite common to see. Uh, look at this one here. We do have multiple you know, wires around here. So these are wires secondary to what they call the uh, coronary, coronary artery bypass graft. So these are called the mediastinal uh, stenotomy wires, which are quite common to see them right into the, uh, the, the midline of the, you know, let's say chest x-ray. And then also look at this one is the aortic valve replacement. That is another, you know, uh, prosthetic you know, valve replacement of the mitral valve. Again, so these are common things that you tend to see, you know, on a chest x-ray. Uh, this is again, is a, is, is, a, is a patient who has got a medical, you know, uh, um, um, equipment put in. Notice that we do have the uh, tracheostomy tube here. The tracheostomy tube is actually at the level of the carina here, which is too, too low. And then, you know, you've got to obviously advise people to pull it back a little bit, you know, so that at least, you know, the, the problem here is that, you know, with a low lying, you know, um, tracheostomy tube, there is actually a likelihood that one of the lungs will not be ventilated. You know, notice also that, you know, there is actually an indwelling, um, um, uh, uh, um, a nasogastric tube, you know, obviously, you know, um, sometimes, you know, uh, you might think that the nasogastric tube is actually right into the stomach, but it should be actually in the lung. And then the patients are fed. Uh, when the patient is fed, uh, you might get an aspiration pneumonia. And then many patients have died because of the fact that, you know, because uh, the, uh, the, the NG tube was not well sighted. And then the patient was, was fed and then they end up having, you know, uh, uh, aspiration pneumonia. This again, notice that, you know, there is the left-sided internal jugular central venous catheter, you know, through the internal, uh, uh, through the, uh, through the, uh, uh, but it's actually in the proximal end of the brachiocephalic vein here. So this is not the proper sighting of this, uh, of this, you know, uh, uh, line. It should be advanced further into the uh, into the uh, uh, superior superior uh, vena cava there. So this is the patient, obviously with COVID, an ITU patient. So uh, it has, so that it has been recited to the possibility the junction between the brachiocephalic and the uh, superior vena cava there. But the rest again, you know, look at that. The tracheostomy tube has been pulled back into its rightful position because the previous one here, the, 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 the thing was actually too low. It was too low to ventilate the both lungs. So, uh, you know, a patient possibly could, uh, could have one of the lungs obviously, you know, uh, uh, collapsing. So this has been recited, you know, these are So when you're looking at these x-rays, always look at uh, those kind of things. Now this x-ray, again, we do have consolidation you know, to the right upper lobe here. So the uh, patchy airspace opacities, you know, in the apical area or the right upper lobe, you know, in this case here, this is quite common in patients with the tuberculosis. Again, look, notice here also on the left side here, there is actually a cavitating mass around here. And um, a cavitating mass, uh, with a cavitating mass to the left upper lobe here. Uh, when a mass is cavitating, it means therefore that the mass is actually sort of getting 
degraded. It's you know, it's a, we are losing bone, we are losing lung, we are losing lung, lung tissue. It is dying. You know, it is dying right inside. So normally, you know, patients with you know uh, cavitating lesions, there, there could be so many kind of you know uh, 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 differentials for that. But largely, you know, would say possibly could be TB, could be cancer, it could be an abscess, it could be infection, it could be it could be anything. So in this case here, uh, people that are blessed with CT, they can do a CT scan, or they may do a you know you don't need a lung biopsy at all. I think you know. Clinicians, if you're a doctor, you put this patient on medication, maybe after six weeks, check another x-ray to see whether this is actually shrinking or it is actually progressing. Notice also there that uh, we do have, you know, generalized uh, airspace shadowing in the right upper lobe here with a central focus of a thick, you know, cavitating lesion, you know, uh, bordering between the uh, the minor, the major fissure here and the upper lobe here. Again, differentials here would be possibly TB or other, you know, uh, uh, entities there. Again, we are talking about the same thing here, could be TB, you know, mirror TB, mirror the TB tends to present with the multiple nodular patterns, you know, uh, which are high in density. For example, if you are able to look at this, you know, I'll, I'll send this presentation to you, you'll be able to see these ones anyway. So these are kind of, you know, uh, they are more or less like, you know, millet kind of uh, uh, millet seeds that you are able to see spread across, you know, uh, the uh, both lungs. Merely TB, you know, basically it is a, a hematogeneously spread, meaning that, you know, the, it is spread throughout the, 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 the blood, the blood and then it tends to be quite diffuse with the, you know, uh, these kind of nodular densities, you know, projected in both lungs and stuff like that. So mirror TB presents in that kind of thing. It is not an interstitial lung disease. Notice on this one here that uh, uh, the densities between the two lungs is different. This is more darker than this one here. And remember in my introduction, the first time we said that we should be able to see the the lingular part of the of the of the heart. So in this case case here, we can't see the lingular aspect of the heart, but we can see what is what is described as a veil-like appearance, which is obscuring the uh, the lingular aspect and the you know lingual aspect of the lung. So we know the heart, the heart. So we know that you know a veil-like appearance like this denotes or suggests the left upper lobe collapse, which we have here. Notice also that you know the in my introduction I said that you know the right hemidiaphragm should always be higher than the left hemidiaphragm by about 1.5 centimeters. In this case here, the left hemidiaphragm has been pulled up, and it's more or less like it's slightly higher than the right hemidiaphragm, meaning therefore that when you do have a lung collapse, lung collapse tends to uh, pull things towards itself, and there is actually reduced lung volume, like we can see on the left side here. So this is a classic example of, uh, you know, uh, left upper lobe collapse. Not, I think we spoke about this one last time. We spoke about this one last time, I think. But what is of interest here is that you know we do have a well circumscribed you know, airspace opacity to the right upper lobe here. But if you really look carefully, you would see that there are internal calcifications in there. So internal calcifications in this case here, this is suggestive of uh, a, a non-aggressive uh, 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 soft or lung, lung, lung condition. So in this case here, this is good news for the patient because this is actually a hematoma. Hematomas tend to present with a well-defined, you know, soft tissue mass in any part of the lungs with the, what they call, uh, I think in, in ultrasound, when you do ultrasound, you know, a dermoid cyst, so people say that, you know, it looks like, you know, it has got teeth inside. That kind of appearance of a dermoid cyst, you know, uh, on an ultrasound or abdominal x-ray or pelvic x-rays rather, you know, it, it may have that kind of, you know, internal calcification like this one here. So a hematoma, is more or less like you know a dermoid cyst you know you see look at the internal calcifications here 
But again, people don't want to leave things to chance. Patient has a CT scan. CT scan again, look at that well-defined, you know, lobular, you know, mass with the internal calcifications, you know, highly, you know, uh, suggestive of a hematoma. I don't know why I'd put this one here, but I think it is because of the uh, uh, somebody has got a hump in the left hemidiaphragm here. So this is just a, a ventration of the hemidiaphragm. Somebody has got just a weakness in the hemidiaphragm there. It's not a mass at all. It's different from this one here. Look at that. We do have a mass, you know, uh, you know, across here to the left, low, right, lower low. Uh, we don't do chest X-rays, which I mean lateral chest X-rays, but in this case, somebody ended up having a CT scan, which obviously, you know, uh, saw that kind of, you know, abnormality there. Um, um, okay, this one we can see again looking at the abnormality here. You know, we do have a triangular mass here in the right perihilar region here. We have lost the contours of the left, of the right um, atrial border. There is enlargement and thickness of the hemidiaphragm of the, of the hilum here. Again, this should be looked at to be, you know, more or less like a mass, you know, uh, or, or cancer of some sort. This is the, what the patient had. And after the CT scan was done, look at that mass. Okay, look at this one here. There is actually enlargement of the right paratracheal stripe here. This could be looked at as a enlarged lymph nodes, you know, in the in the metastinum here. This is a patient who presented with the, you know, uh, contact with TB. When you see lymphadenopathy here, uh, most likely this could be TB particularly if you have been in contact with somebody with tuberculosis. Um, notice here that uh, because of the time, I'm going, just going to rush. Not, notice also here that uh, we do have a mass in the left upper lobe here and another mass obviously down you know, this end here. Um, you know, previously, they only had this mass here you know, to the Periphery of the left of the right lower lung zone. Patient at a CT scan, we can see that this patient has got a mass down there, and they do have destruction of the rib, you know, uh, you know, in 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 this region here. So this is what they call the extra pleural mass here, because it is extending from the outside the the thoracic cage and destroying the the rib itself, and you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, notice here that the patient has got, you know, uh, the, all these uh, lung uh, surgical clips, surgical clips here, and then we have we have got no breast tissue here, possibly it has been removed, you know, so basically this patient could have, you know, uh, um, uh, breast cancer, which has spread, look at the mass in the right upper lobe here, and unilateral you know, pro-refusion. You know, lateral pro refusions are quite dangerous. They are much more common in the patients with actually, you know, masses or cancers or possibly even infection could cause that. But notice this patient, I would be very confident to say that this is actually lung cancer or metastatic lung cancer because of the presence of these, you know, surgical clips, looking at that mass here and unilateral pro refusion with the pleural thickening. There's pleural thickening around here. So basically this could be uh, cancer. Notice here, this is actually the mass we're looking at in the upper thing here. Notice also that we do lose the contours or the definition of this vertebra here. Patient at the CT scan, the mass is there. There is destruction of the, of the, of the bones here. Notice here that we do have uh, metastatic spread to the bones around. So these are all destroyed. Look at this destruction here with a gibus deformity at this, at this, at this level here. Uh, exaggerated, you know, kyphosis in the, in the midsection of the thoracic, you know, spine. So there's actually widespread, you know, uh, metastatic, you know, deposits into the, the spine itself. I think we spoke about this last time. This is an air bronchogram. We do have consolidation in the alveoli with the patency of the 
bronchus and the bronchioles, you know, so this is actually, you know, uh, infection. Look at this hemida, uh, the hilum here on the left side. It is actually there's a lob lobulated mass around here. Again, this could be, you know, uh, an anterior, anterior replaced mass. Possibly needs a CT scan, you know, to further evaluate that. Uh, let me, I think we spoke about this last time. Uh, notice also on the PA projection, when you do the PA projection, you must make sure that you see, the, you must see through the, the heart to see the spine. But what is of interest here is that you know, we do have the ectatic, you know, I, descending aorta here. So there is actually something of going on here with the, with the aorta here. Should I need, you know, further investigation here? Possibly yes, because this could be an aneurysm or descending thoracic aorta. Uh, this is just talking about, you know, uh, high line enlargement, uh, which is the, you know, CT, you know, showing that. Yeah. So this is just the uh, uh, hiatus hernia. We do have the stomach right into the chest here with uh, an air fluid level here. So a hiatus hernia, again, remember, it may cause widening of the subcarino uh, angle here. So the, you know, uh, yeah, so this is just the hiatus hernia here. We have a patient who possibly who is without even a clinical history, one would tell that this, this patient, you know, is a smoker. Uh, the reason is that, you know, we do have large bilateral volume lungs here with the flattened, you know, hemidiaphragms, you know, the two uh, hyperlucent. We can see prominence of the uh, vasculature. We can also see that you know, the heart is quite narrow here. The, uh, if I do the cardiothoracic ratio, you know, the ratio will be far much, you know, uh, lower than the, the usual, you know, 0.5 here. So this is quite common in patients with the pulmonary, you know, uh, emphysema or people, you know, COPD kind of thing. And uh, we do have some kind of, you know, uh, um, an infected or um, lung scarring, you know, with the Ebola, in the upper lobe of the right lung here. So again, this one, I think it's just a mass here, possibly with the atelectasis, you know, basal atelectasis here. Uh, bronchogram here, you know, that's the same mass we're talking about here. Now, this is one of the x-rays I wanted to talk about. So we do have an enlarged heart. The heart is enlarged. And then we do have bilateral pre-refusions here. What is of interest is that, you know, normally anatomically speaking, I think Ivan Chete last time spoke to me about this, or I think it was about Murang, I think. He asked me a question about uh, cephalization. Cephalization is where normally the, the blood vessels that supply the lower part of the lung, they are smaller than the, the ones that supply the upper bit of the lung. So if there is actually heart failure, the reverse, happens. So we do have dilatation of the uh, upper venous, you know, uh, venous supply. So there is actually enlargement of the upper vessels here, meaning that there is actually what they call the upper lobe venous diversions or cephalization in this case, with very hazy um, airspace opacities, there is water now being perfusing through the vasculature here. So we do have pulmonary edema here, uh, uh, cephalization here, heart enlargement, and the pluriffusions, a classic example of a heart, a heart failure in this case. So this patient has got a heart failure because they do have all those things I was, I was talking about. Okay, this one, again, we can see there's a pluriffusion here, which is lo loculated here. There is actually loss of volume on the right, on the, on the, on the left side here, again, you know, it could be due to infection. Again, look, notice here that, you know, the apex here is actually white. This could be a mass, which is pulling the trachea towards it. So this patient, if I was, you know, uh, you know, reporting that, this patient becomes a candidate for a CT scan with, you know, to rule out possible cancer and things like that. So this is a patient who has got, you know, upper lobe cancer here 
with the you know uh, necro necrosis ha happening in the centre of that uh, that mass. This is some patient. Again, I think I want to talk about that. We have spoken about the high lamb actually. Now, this is the patient who came from the, uh, from the clinics. Uh, we see this kind of, you know, um, uh, I think they came for a shoulder, shoulder pain and uh, a chest x-ray. The, ch the shoulder x-ray here, the, the bones are quite crisp. Not everything is nice, you know, except that they do have, you know, multiple, you know, uh, you know surgical clips here. When I looked at the chest x-ray, I could see something here. Look at the retrocardiac density. There is a well circumscribed soft tissue density behind the heart here, which combining this with this, this is actually suspicious of uh, lung, can you know, uh, lung cancer. So CT scan was requested, you know, look at that mass just around there and the patient had uh, you know, lung cancer. So in summary, Use the A, B, C, D, and the E to review your areas, airways, breathing, circulation, disability, and everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I end my presentation. Any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Sinkala. Uh, this was a wonderful wrap up of the first presentation which we had. I would like to thank you for this presentation. Uh, I would like you, to sir. also thank you everyone in attendance, all those who are not uh, in medical imaging, you are welcome. Uh, the, 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 the last images you have explained, I think that uh, arose from, from myself and Mr. Cuthbert Muringa about uh, pulmonary edema. You have yeah, actually right. explained uh, your yeah, cephalization can be seen and uh, you have explained everything there because when you see cephalizations on a chest x-ray, it's related to a cardiac problem or pulmonary yes. edema. Thank you so yeah. much about that. Um, at this point in time, before we take any questions, I would like uh, to thank you, Mr. Sinkala, the presenter, and also let me recognize the presence again of Dr. Monsanje, Dr. Stroni, Dr. Wanga, our president, Mr. Mwansa, and uh, Mr. Kafuimbi. Thank you so much, uh, you're welcome. I think we can now proceed if there are any questions. After questions, then we'll have a word to the, uh, the people from the people I've actually mentioned. Thank you so much. Any questions? I can see uh, Jennifer, uh, Geneva. Yeah? You can go ahead. I can see someone raising their hand by the name of Jan Via. Please, you can uh, go ahead with your contribution or question. Um, he says you, you unmute, uh, unmute him. Okay, thank you so much. I was joined by the host. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mike Sinkala, for your presentation. It has been a wonderful presentation and uh, more elaborative. However, I, I have an issue concerning pulmonary edema. If you can help me go on your first slide, where you describe the pulmonary edema. Right, okay. So, um... pulmonary edema. Sorry about that. Just uh, let me just go back. Oh, sorry about that. You know, um, uh, I'm looking for the slide. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, pulmonary edema. So let, let us let us assume the lung is, 
is not able, or the, the heart is not able to pump, you know, or to work at its optimum, you know, potential. So there is now fluid. Sorry to come in, Mr. Sinkara. My apologies. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sir. Uh, maybe we can uh, let him finish his question, then you can uh, proceed. Okay, now, oh, sorry. My, sorry. <laughs> my question here. Okay, my question here on the pulmonary infusion of this year, which is with accumulation of the lungs called acid, okay, according to what I thought to be, but to any. So it is fluid now accumulating in a review. I think our brother is breaking. Uh, is it okay if you can uh, type his question in the chat? Then you can respond to that okay. later. Okay, yeah, let me type, type the chat then. Yeah, sure, thank you. Okay. Uh, while uh, okay. he's typing, can someone uh, ask a question? Any other questions, contributions, observations, or deliberations? Uh, you can go ahead, sir. <coughs> Take no pop to F uh, mark one. You can go ahead. Sure. You can you can go ahead, sir. Okay, I just want to find out I want to find out we are waiting so that we have is it only me who's uh, receiving a breaking signal or everyone is uh, receiving a breaking signal? I think there's a problem with the... Uh, sir, I think you can also type your question or your concern in the chat and we'll be able to respond to you. In the meantime, let's respond to the... Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, can I go ahead, yes, sir? Genevieve? Uh, yes. You can, uh, you can proceed, sir. Yes. There are two types of, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary edema. There's what they call alveolar edema and interstitial edema. So you are right by saying that, you know, can it, can it be called uh, you know, uh, yes, you can have alveolar edema, which means that you know, it is actually right into the alveolar spaces. This is the one that you see, you know, uh, some books describe it as the angel wing appearance. It will be in the uh, peri perihylar region. It will be uh, clustered like a classic angel wing or angel wing appearance. That is what they call the uh, alveolar edema. You can also have interstitial edema, like the one I was talking about, like this is sept septal lines. These septal lines are an example of interstitial edema, all right? So this is interstitial edema because the, the interstitium is actually filled with the fluid, you know, secondary to, you know, an infection or, you know, a fluid pass, it could be lymph, lymph node, you know, uh, involvement and things like that. See, yes, 
you can have alveolar edema, pulmonary edema. You can also have, you know, uh, interstitial uh, edema. Thank you, sir. So alveolar edema largely is secondary to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, heart failure. Uh, but when you see uh, septal lines like this, uh, interstitial edema with a linear, you know, kind of an involvement in a patient with no heart conditions and things like that, you know, one would be worried about, you know, lymphagitis, carcinomatosa, or any other type of cancer we need to look at and things like that. And that's why I said there are different types of you know, lung conditions. It's either it is actually affecting the lung parenchyma or it is actually interstitial. So interstitial conditions and parenchymal conditions are totally different. So going forward, you know, uh, if, if the, the moderators you know, ask me to present any of the conditions, let's say, you know, um, uh, let's say, you know, we talk about, you know, pneumocystic carrying pneumonia or uh, cryptogenic pneumonias or any type of pneumonia, we can take one subject and then talk about that subject, you know, uh, you know, and instead of talking about so many things like this, we can talk about TB, we can talk about, you know, whatever, you know, uh, it depends on, you know, what we need to look at. But otherwise, this presentation was only meant to highlight a few things that we may be look, talking about in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sinkada. I think at this point we can uh, we can have uh, some few words from uh, the mentors I mentioned uh, earlier. We can start with uh, Dr. Musanje. Thank you. Dr. Musanje. Otherwise, okay, it's okay now. It's okay. Okay. Okay, sorry, I think I was not able to speak earlier on because I think I couldn't unmute. I think now it's fine. First of all, I would like to thank you, I don't know whether people are getting me. You are getting me? Yes, sir. loud and clear, Doc. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. We want to appreciate you know the sharing that Mr. Mike Sinkara has done. And um, the other time I missed, I think, but I think I was told that actually. It was a very useful information, and I think we look forward to such a kind of interaction. And I think um, as a profession, this is, a, I think, a very good example that we have got a big role to play in, in, the, in, the, in this industry, in so health. And um, I think he is Zambia, where actually Mr. Skara comes from. I think he knows very well that uh, this kind of role is very useful in this country. And I think uh, through the Radical Society of Zambia, I know that we've done a lot of work to try to create a space where people can uh, practice in this, in this manner. And I think at this moment, I will really try to urge the Radical Society of Zambia that uh, we really pursue, because I know that uh, the, the, the work has already been done. So on that, I think uh, we are at the final stage whereby then people will be able to register accordingly, according to, to, to you know, the level of the specialization, because I do know that this kind of work, it will be at that level where people will be able to specialize in the, in the area, whether it's CT, whether it's MRI, whether it's convention and so on, up to the, this space, up to this space where people are able to interpret. And um, I think I would like to encourage others to also venture into this kind of work, especially that now we foresee a situation that there will be room but obviously, when we, we reach this level, we know that it's a higher responsibility, whereby 
even I know that our members will be able to reach out. They will be able to be pressed in various areas. And through ICT, as you can see now, the Sanskara is in UK and we are able to interact with him. So this is the same way we'll be able also to foster this kind of work. For example, in our remote areas, remote parts of the country, we can have specialists in some areas, but as we learn, we are going to also use the city as a tool to learn, to, like continue professional development. So that even if we have got both experiences who, who, who vary, we can have some people, even if I've said before that sometimes we will say that we don't have consultant radiologists, but as long as we have one or two and they are able to cut a, a wider space and we have people in the front line that will work at that level, in this case, we are talking of our radiographers who will go to these extended roles, which means we'll be able to service our communities better. I think with these uh, few uh, uh, comments and the um, encouragement to all of us that let's continue this work. I think he, I will leave uh, some time for others also to make to share with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Doc, on that one. An emphasis on the role of uh, ICT in uh, healthcare uh, delivery is very important. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Stone. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. I, I hope I'm audible. Yes, Doc, you are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinkala. Another a wonderful presentation from yourself. Uh, it's highlighted a lot of important things, but I think more importantly, uh, just to show that uh, there's quite a lot more that we need to learn and we're still, uh, we still need to put in quite a bit. Uh, on a light note, uh, Mr. Anchete, I, I think he, um, the assignment that we gave you has been given away by Mr. Sinkala by doing the ABCDE assignment. So I, I hope I receive my assignments in good time. Uh, good evening to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we will use this to, to develop the assignment, Doc. Thank you so much. <laughs> the student, I'm very sorry, like, you know, I've given away the answer. I'm so sorry, but make, make sure you are, you, are, you are really strict, you know, to my. Thank you. Uh, our president, Mr. Monsa. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Once again, we, um, we are so great to um, uh, always uh, a thing. Uh, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, may we continue working like this. For the other time, I was uh, privileged to be in a special meeting where we are trying to promote new law extension. But people didn't know that the developers are very small. So we are able to profound on that issue. So if we are given an opportunity to listen in that kind of presentation, well structured, everything in place, I think people will know that we have neglected this profession as well. When we have these uh, uh, such kind of interaction and we have such kind of uh, presentation, I think. This role can greatly help. And then, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. 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 I think we are on the right track. Um, so, um, uh, think, uh, uh, we are so Sir, you can kindly so, speak up or get close to your mic, Mike. How I wish, how I wish, uh, 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 I think uh, we are having technical challenges. And Dr. Wanga, you can go ahead. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Singara, for another 
wonderful presentation. We, we really appreciate <laughs> for sharing your knowledge with the, with the colleagues. Like, like everyone was, uh, as mentioned previously, you know, we need to work together and push uh, reporting radiographers in, in Zambia because it, it, it will benefit the country. Because at the moment, we, we only have 12 radiologists and all these are based in, I think, three or four hospitals. And uh, more than 130, 130 to 140 hospitals have got no, no radiologists. But we need, again, as we are pushing, to provide more evidence through, through research. So research will be very, very important. Then the last thing is, like in the last one year, since we have started this CPD, we have seen that we have got experts within the radiographs, both the, uh, local radiographers and desktop radiographers. So it's important that we can work together and develop our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanga. Uh, the last but not the least, uh, Mr. Kafuimbi, you can go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't even know that I was supposed to speak. Um, yeah, but anyway, Mr. Sinkara, thank you very much once again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I think most of the things that needed to be said have been said, but let me just re-echo, especially what Dr. Monsanje mentioned, that um, we, it's, it's about time we needed to reposition ourselves as radiographers so that we can slowly begin to venture into such work that, that as Mr. S uh, Dr. Mr. Sinkala is performing in the UK, so that we can, we can save our people. But as you can see from what has been presented, it comes with a lot of effort, it comes with a lot of training, and it comes with a lot of experience. So we will need to be very careful in the way that we roll out this extended rows, but uh, suffice to say that it's doable uh, with the commitment from everyone we should be able to do. I also would like to thank the, 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 the current executive that you've continued actually with these presentations. I think it's a good thing. We can see now that we are seeing things that we've never seen. We are meeting people we've never met and we are discovering expertise that we thought we didn't have when we, we actually had. So congrats, kudos to the new executive, especially my young brother, Ed Mwansa, wherever he is. He sounds like he's in a drum or something. Good evening. Uh, thank you so uh, very much. Uh, indeed, uh, a tree, if you plant a tree, it needs uh, the right ingredients. And I think everyone has spoken uh, to that effect. So uh, once again, thank you, uh, everyone. Unless we have uh, any other questions before I, I make any other announcements. Are there any other questions? I think there are some questions in the chat here. Okay. Uh, I think, <laughs> okay, the name of the Irish chap, I think it was the Dr. Curley. Curley, I think is the chap that sort of described the uh, uh, septal lines, Dr. Curley. Uh, uh, and then, um, Okay, they say very important lesson. I'm kindly asking the organizers to send me a link on time. Okay. Um, there is a, okay, we, we answer that one. I, are there any pathological chest x ray features in epileptic patients? Um, not really, no. I think epilepsy possibly is more neuro, 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 neurogenic. Uh, but if somebody has accidentally sort of swallowed, you know, saliva, or you, you might see features of, let's say, um, uh, features of uh, um, uh, uh, pneumonia, um, uh, aspiration pneumonia. You might see it possibly in the lower uh, aspect of the right lung. So it would be aspiration pneumonia, but otherwise it's not pathognomonic for uh, epileptic patients at all. Uh, yeah, I think those are the questions that were asked in the, in the chat. 
Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, very much. I've, uh, I've actually sent my email address uh, via the chat. If there are any questions, I think so, uh, you can send through that email. So uh, once again, thank you very much, Mr. Sinkala, for this wonderful presentation. It's not basic, as you have put it. We have said that. <laughs> OK. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's past uh, nine. And uh, let me just take this time to thank you everyone in attendance. Thank you all uh, our guests uh, who are in here. And uh, let me just uh, mention some something quick. Uh, Radiological Society of Zambia is actually mandated to give uh, CPD points to everyone in Zambia who is in attendance. We are actually taking notes. Uh, what you just need to do is uh, be a member of us, subscribe. Once you do that, at the end of the year, we will take note of uh, whatever we are doing. Is it a presentation or whatever it is, then uh, at the end of the year, we'll write uh, letters uh, to you so that you can uh, be giving CBT uh, points in order for you to renew your practicing license. Our next meeting will be uh, on 20th uh, April. It will be announced uh, a week before. Mm -hmm. So uh, not until then, uh, thank you very much. Well, if there are any questions anyone can ask, I'll give you two more minutes before we close. Thank you very much. <laughs>